Turn up the volume in honor of International Amateur Radio Day. And this is Tesla Unwired Broadcast, featuring a special lineup of ham radio enthusiasts. Baseball legend Joe Rudy, Ted Rappaport, the innovator who brought us 5G technology, and Ed Wilson, the vice president of the Suffolk County Radio Club. I'm your host, Mark Alessi, executive director of the Tesla Science Center. And we gathered this panel of radio champions to share their knowledge and stories of how radio transformed their lives and work. We're also going to explore the radio resurgence that's taking place in the world, as well as possibilities for the future of amateur radio. Let's start by meeting our guests and learning about their special connections to radio. Ted Rappaport, Ted's research has led to groundbreaking knowledge in wireless communications, including the millimeter wave technology that brought us 5G. Uh, he founded NYU Wireless and the research centers at the University of Texas, Austin, and Virginia Tech. Ted now serves as the David Lee Ernst Weber uh, Professor at NYU with appointments in several departments. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors and a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the Wireless History Foundation Hall of Fame. And most recently, the Tesla Science Center honored him as the innovator of the year at our gala last year. Welcome to the program today, Ted. Hi, Mark. Great to be with you. And it's great to be with Joe Rudy, a great ham radio contester and a baseball hero of mine when I was a kid. And also Ed Wilson, 73, you guys. That's <laughs> so, uh, so, and that, that brings me to, to uh, Joe Rudy. Joe, uh, as Ted said, is a baseball legend whose professional career spanned from 1967 to 1982. Joe is a three-time All-Star, three-time World Series champion, and three-time Gold Glove Award winner. He is also a longtime ham radio advocate who has been instrumental in promoting and developing this field. Thank you, Joe, for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Mark. Good to be here and always fun. I enjoyed the last session we had with Tesla and the uh, celebration there uh, for Ted and uh, such a, a great uh, outreach and uh, uh, getting all this out on the on the national uh, you know, ham radio day is uh, pretty awesome. Thank you. And then, and then finally, a third guest, Ed Wilson. Ed Wilson is a law enforcement professional who became a licensed amateur radio operator in 1993. His interests in radio include emergency communications, home brewing, and digital modes. Ed currently serves as community manager for the M17 project. I'm gonna to wanna to know more about that, Ed. A new open source digital radio protocol. He is also vice president of the Suffolk County Radio Club, which Suffolk County is where the Tesla Science Center is located. It's Long Island's oldest club and uh, they are often at our events right here at the Tesla campus. Uh, Ed, again, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for having me, guys. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. So I, I, I'm going to throw out a question just to get us started. And uh, you know, first, I'm going I'm to uh, ask you, uh, Ted, I know your interest in ham radio uh, started in your childhood. Can you tell us how, how you got introduced to ham radio? Yeah, I, I was very lucky. My grandfather, Grandpa Carl, had an old shortwave radio. And when I was five years old, he introduced it to me and I used to tune around and hear things and heard Morse code and single sideband. I was just fascinated. And later he gave me an old CB radio. I didn't realize it wouldn't work because it didn't have any crystals in it. But, you know, I was a kid tinkering around. And by the time I was 12, I was playing with walkie talkies. And uh, then when I was 13, I was playing football. I call it the best break of my life because I broke my leg in three places. And um, I was laid up in a body cast in the hospital for six weeks and then six months where all I could do is lay there. So my grandma bought me a short wave radio. I listened around. I learned Morse code, taught myself Morse code. And after that, growing up in Indiana, Richmond, Indiana, Cambridge City, um, after I was out of the body cast, I, 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 I walked up on crutches and um, hiked up to a ham, WB9NNO, Doc Woodward, the local veterinarian. 
he gave me my novice license. And then I started to teach adults ham radio, Morse code and electric theory while I was a teenager. I think the love of radio started when I was five, but it was ham radio that allowed me to develop my interest in teaching and communications and the love of wireless. I was inventing antennas as a kid, putting them on the roof of the house. I didn't know exactly how the theory worked, but that fascination, that magic of wireless has never left. Oh, that, that's pretty obvious because you just helped light up the world with the latest generation of, of cell phones with, with 5G. <laughs> and uh, you could kind of draw the line all the way back to those early experiences with, with amateur radio. Uh, uh, Joe, how, how about you? Did you, did you uh, get an early start also in ham radio? I didn't get my license early on. I think my first uh, encounter with uh, DXing, I called it, was well, I grew up on a dairy in my grandparents' dairy. And uh, my grandfather had a big old Philco radio that had the old curved top on it, if you remember those way back when. And he had a wire going out the window up into a tree. And uh, I remember going in there at night and listening. And uh, somehow I got into the thing with turning around, turning the knobs. I think he was the one that told me first that you could hear different stations at night than you could during the daytime. And I started keeping a little log book of the stations I could hear because I grew up in the Central Valley about 100 miles east of San Francisco and uh, but during the day as we all know you're going, only going to hear local stuff on AM and then at night I'd hear Salt Lake City, LA, Seattle, all that kind of stuff. It was exciting to, to tune around and see what I could hear and then obviously I got a little older, got into teenage years and sports and a few girls here and there and uh Anyway, my wife's listening, so I got to be careful there. Anyway, <laughs> so Joe, when when you were a kid, was it radio, baseball, pizza, and girls, and kind of that order, changing around? Well, you know, radio took took a back uh, back seat probably from the time I was ten or eleven years old. But I was uh, fairly large for my age, and so I was playing on two or three different uh, teams from Little League to Babe Ruth when I was 10, 11, 12. Wow. And so that's really got started. I didn't get back into my first real encounter with ham radio, believe it or not. If you guys remember a gentleman by the name of Bo Belinsky, who sure. was a great pitcher through a no hitter with the Angels. Well, I played uh, winter baseball with him down in Caracas, Venezuela uh, during the winter of 1968. And uh, we all lived in the same uh uh, condo tower thing they put all the americans there was three teams in crocus and uh, i got invited by Bo and his wife anyway we went over to a friends of his house that was lived in in crocus and there you know you're either rich or really poor and obviously this is a rich family and the son uh, had a tower that came out the roof of the house and we got to go in there and and uh, Bo would go over there a couple times a week and was able to, you know, by getting into the uh, the phone lines there uh, in LA, contact the ham there and able to talk to his family over the ham radio. So that was my real first introduction to it. Uh, and then I didn't really encounter it again until uh, the mid seventies, we had moved to a new home out in Danville, California, once I got established with the A's out there. And I, we had moved up on the side of this hill in Danville and right in, uh, about two or 300 yards to the south of us on the same hill was a place called San Damiano Retreat, which was the Catholic retreat place. Uh, and uh, one, one of the priests there, two of the brothers and the handy, handyman that sort of took care of the grounds were all hands. Wow. And the, uh, the handyman lived uh, down a little ways below there and had a tower and that, that sort of piqued my interest and I ended up starting to go down there uh, in the evenings especially on weekends or something when I had got home uh, and sat with him and started listening on the radio and they were big baseball fans so we left them tickets all the time and they ended up giving me my life my novice steps so I got but they, they were the ones that really got me peeked into that and then things just kept going forward and uh, I said over the years I progressed up to extra of course but that was my real first introduction where I could sit and listen day after day when I wanted to on ham radio. So uh, before I move on to Ed uh, you know you, you bring up a good question for me Joe and, and that is 
there's different levels of operational certification uh, for ham radio. I'm, I'm not familiar with them. Uh, yeah, Joe got his license when you had to know the Morse code. You don't need the Morse code anymore, but Joe, you learned to copy CW, didn't you? Yeah, no, I, I, I did. Uh, it's actually my favorite uh, way of operating now. I'm much more in the CW than I am the sideband, but uh, I enjoy all the contests. I really got started out uh, contesting on sideband and then I realized I was missing half of the contest by not getting the CW so that's when I uh, was fortunate just a couple of years after I got licensed to get exposed to that and uh, so uh, yeah when I'm, I've got my license there was five levels so now there's only three but you start out as a, as a novice and I think it's technician now I think they've done away with the novice and then you go in the general and, and extra, they've done away with the other two levels. So it's a, it's a little simpler. They've done away with the, the code requirements. And that was always scary going into the FCC offices, is try, trying to copy there. And your hands are shaking so much. It's, you know, I'm playing in front of millions of guys and I'm scared to death trying to take a test. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so uh, if you have like a, a, a technician, does that mean like you can't get a certain radio and, and use it uh, if you don't have the next level of certification and, and pass the test or? Exactly, it, it, as you went up the levels, uh, you know, novice test was ma mainly just to get you exposed to radio. I think, um, Ted, you're gonna have to help me remember a little bit or, or Ed there, I think, you know, you had uh, maybe 10 meters that the, uh, the uh, novice could get on back then and then you went to the yeah. technician. Which you basically were limited in frequencies. If you, there yeah. originally, the technician would not allow you on the HF bands. It was only the very, very UHF, ultra high frequency and above where you could only talk maybe 20 or 30 miles. The real fun was at the HF high frequency bands. And of course, Morse code or CW goes farther around the world on limited power than sideband. So as you got the higher levels of uh, license, you got more spectrum privileges, more radio privileges that allowed you to use more frequencies that are better at night and day and more bands. And um, of course, extra was the highest and you had basically unlimited use of the various frequencies from HF, which are the frequencies that Marconi used, you know, the very low frequencies, the very large wavelengths, 160 meter band, uh, all the way up to very, very high UHF, VHF microwave, and even millimeter wave, where moon bounce is done. Wow. So Ed, uh, being here on Long Island, I'm gonna have to rely on you to help us get through that process. But Ed, tell us how, how you got involved with ham radio and at what I got, age? I got involved listening to local emergency communications at probably about the age of five. Um, my uncle, who was a fire department uh, member, uh, FDNY member, uh, gave me a handheld crystal scanner, and I was able to listen to all the different fire department frequencies in New York City. Um, from then, I moved on to a programmable scanner where I started monitoring the NYPD frequencies. And then uh, eventually I started scanning through the spectrum, and I found these uh, guys talking about all sorts of crazy things on uh, the local two-meter repeaters. Ed were, Ed, were you young then, or were you an adult? Uh, oh, I was young. I uh, probably found ham radio probably about... 13 or 14 years old yeah started doing some investigations on it and then um i learned that there was a morse code requirement i tried to learn it and it just wasn't for me so i kind of pushed the uh ham radio desire to the side continued monitoring the uh, local emergency communications and then sometime in the early 90s they did away with the morse code requirement and uh, i came into the hobby as a no code technician and that was probably about 1993 and uh, I uh, predominantly use just VHF and UHF frequencies. I didn't really get into HF or upgrade my license up until uh, last year. So. And has that, uh, how, how much has that changed uh, your use of radio as you've upgraded your license? Is it a, a different broadcast that you're focused on now? Or are you speaking to different folks or what are you concentrating on? Well, I predominantly still use VHF and UHF. I do have uh, HF privileges, which I do use sometimes. Um, I like to play around on 17 meters. That seems to be my uh, favorite band of choice as of late. So, uh, 
a lot more uh, global communications are available uh, using RF on the HF frequencies than on the uh, more local H, uh, VHF and UHF. Mark, what I think is amazing is um, in all of our stories, we all have been ham radio operators for many decades. And what's, what's incredible is Joe Rudy learned about ham radio in Venezuela before long distance and the internet was inexpensive. I mean, Joe was using a phone patch, which was using ham radio to carry non-business phone calls, you know, from LA to Venezuela. And a lot of the ham radio operators of the 1970s and 80s became the engineers that built the cellular telephone industry and the internet. There are so many famous hams that built the wireless companies, the internet companies that all got into ham radio through one way or another. You know, uh, I'm, I'm gonna dial it back for a second in terms of thinking of the world before wireless communication, before ham radio, before cell phones, um, you know, we're the Tesla Science Center. Uh, Nikola Tesla uh, was really enthralled with the uh, potential opportunity of wireless communications. And uh, as early as 1901 uh, was experimenting on, on wireless communications and, and remote control, you know, uh, being able to wirelessly uh, communicate with uh, what he called the teleautomaton, but a remote controlled boat. And um, when you, when you think about the public that you know couldn't fathom, you know, in, at the turn of the 20th century, a boat uh, being controlled remotely. When he uh, brought that boat for exhibition at Madison Square Garden, they accused him of having a trained monkey inside, because <laughs> it's, it's akin to uh, you know telling you, "Excuse me for one second, I'm going to go behind this tree and teleport to Mars." You know, they just couldn't fathom that that kind of technology. And, you know, um, but between his work and, and, and Marconi's work, how much have any of you uh, looked at, at some of that early work uh, and that history since becoming involved with, with amateur radio? Yeah, I, I'll go first because I, I was fascinated with it. I read about Marconi and about Tesla and about Fessenden and the forest. Um, it was a really when I started teaching in the uh, late 1980s, I became fascinated with it and became involved with the Radio Club of America, the world's oldest radio society. And I was very fortunate early in my career to win the Marconi Young Scientist Award in 1990. So I was 29 years old. And I got to meet Marconi's living oldest daughter, Joia Marconi Braga. And we became pen pals for many years and so I read a lot about Marconi and, and how he developed and even heard from his daughter, uh, how that whole enterprise evolved. And then uh, of course, Tesla and Marconi were contemporaries, all vying for funding for their entrepreneurial ideas. And what I find amazing is that these visionaries, Tesla, he predicted that all of us would be walking around with a mobile device. I think in the 1920s, maybe it was earlier, I remember reading something about Nikola Tesla, he predicted everyone would have a device where we would um, communicate around the world. So he was really prescient. He saw this. Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, that's why I love research. I can work on things that maybe seem like science fiction today. People thought 5G and millimeter wave would be science fiction. That's the tip of the iceberg. But for me, I've always been inspired by the Nikola Teslas of the world. And I think it's great. There's a museum and energy meant to keep the memory and the accomplishments and the vision of Tesla and Marconi and others alive. I think it's important. It's important, especially for youth, I think, to realize that they can change the world. I, I, I'm really enthralled with, with the, the fact that a lot of the, you mentioned that a lot of the folks that have been involved with connecting us through uh, you know, cell phones uh, were originally ham radio enthusiasts and, and you know, so what is, what potentially is behind that correlation? Is it that they just happen to be fascinated with all things wireless or are there building blocks within the, you know, learning the ham radio process and, and how it works where it's easier for them, their mind to go to a point where 
they understand uh, RF uh, engineering and, and when what's needed for cellular. Well, I'll comment and I'm sure uh, Ed and Joe have, have other thoughts because they came at the hobby a different way and they've seen much more I'm sure than I have. But what I've seen is when youth get excited about something and start mastering the capability, they gain more confidence. As human beings, it's hard, it's hard to like uh, what you don't know. But as you get to know something and you find out you enjoy it or you're good at it, it's very easy to take that into your career and into uh, what, what you do for a living and, and, and the contributions you make. I can think of so many amazing ham radio operators as kids who changed the world for us. Uh, Fred Terman, who was the dean at Stanford who created Silicon Valley, was a ham when he was young. Uh, Collins Radio, uh, Collins, a great company. He was a youngster doing ham radio when he was young, messing with tubes. Uh, Walter Cronkite, the world's most recognized newscaster, was a ham radio operator, and he wound up going into broadcast. Owen Garriott, the famous astronaut who's been on the space shuttle and made ham radio contacts. I got to work him on a two-meter radio when I was a student at Purdue. The astronaut flying around the world with ham radio. I think that you get into it young, and so you just get comfortable with it. Computers, radio, it's all there in the hobby of ham radio. But others like Ed and Joe came and saw it in a totally different way. So they probably have a different perspective. Ed, Ed Joe, have you, have you seen a, a light turn on? Uh, not only obviously within yourselves as you got turned on to ham radio, but have you seen it in, in uh, you know, young people getting involved with ham radio? I know I have. Um, I feel that the spirit of ham radio is based on uh, building things and experimenting. Uh, I wholeheartedly believe that the original hackers were ham radio operators. And with some of the projects that I'm involved with lately, we see uh, an incoming of these younger um, hacker culture type of people coming into the hobby, especially with the open source project that I'm involved with now. So it's great to see the, the youth coming in and not necessarily uh, just coming in for some of the older modes like uh, single sideband and working CW but some of the newer, uh, more fascinating stuff like working satellites, working some of these digital modes and uh, building their own equipment. Yeah, you know, it's sort of the same way, you know, it's, I, I've met, you know, thousands of hams over my 45 years of being a ham now. And I can't tell you, I wish I'd have kept track, but it can be impossible. The number of them that I met that were electrical engineers, they started out, you know, in their younger years, getting into ham radio, getting exposed, exposed to that technology and piqued their interest and uh, it just led them down that career of getting the you know their ee and uh, moving on to so many different facets it's just uh, it's a great thing about ham radio is there's something for everybody i mean all the way from you know my side which i love contesting all the way up into the very high frequency stuff like we're talking about moon bounce and uh, all the different new technical things they've got uh, what they call ft8 now which is uh, computers talking to computers at levels we can't even hear like 20 30 db below are, are being able to hear the computers are able to talk to each other all over the world on very low power very small antenna uh, as i moved down here to florida i had to give up my big station and i just have a very simple uh, 20 foot flagpole antenna just a vertical piece of metal sticking up and uh, especially on FT8, I've worked all over the world, which is still mind blowing to me at my old age that, uh, that I can do this. So there's just so many facets. And so I think as you, these kids get involved at an early age, what you've tried to get them to do, um, I had four children and I was only able to get my, my, uh, my oldest son to get his ham license. And uh, so he's mainly on VHF and UHF out of his car now, but uh, Anyway, it's a great hobby, as I've said before, and it, uh, there's just something for everybody. Yeah, and, and as hobby Joe, hobbies. Joe, and Joe pointed out, um, he built an amazing contest station, which is lots of towers and lots of antennas, and I've done that too. Um, it's so exciting to do that as a pastime, and you don't have to be technical. You get into ham radio and you learn about it. You learn about it from others. It's a very social uh, network. In fact, you can go around the world and any ham radio operator on the world, there's about three and a half million of us licensed by our governments in hundreds of countries. It's like a, it's a fraternity. You know a ham radio operator in any country 
it's virtually you've got an instant friend and not not people are not technical but they build these stations and um joe has an amazing he had an amazing contest station and um very famous big signal could talk around the world and i've built one in my rural home in virginia on top of a mountain you know it's kind of a fun part-time thing to do you don't have to be technical there's this worldwide community and always a local community of people that will help you get involved, lend you equipment, provide expertise. It's just a fascinating way to learn and keep up with things. And there's so many facets, as Joe and Ed said, from emergency communication and helping out local marathon races in your community to uh, passing emergency traffic or sensing where things are. Ham radio is so diverse and it's a, it's a great, it's a great hobby. There's a couple of questions that, that that just come right out of that, and and I, I was thinking it, you know, Ed, uh, yeah, this is a hobby, but uh, you know, Ted mentioned it and you mentioned it. Uh, this is an essential communication device when in an emergency, especially when communications go down. Um, and I know that you know that's one of the things that you're you're interested in is the emergency services aspects. Uh, uh, you know, can you give us any instances, you know, whether you've experienced them or you know of them where ham radio became an essential communication tool? Uh, I'll give you a couple from my personal involvement. Um, like I said earlier, I was involved uh, with radio. I got first license in the early 90s and uh, living on Long Island, I joined our local Aries group, which is the Amateur Radio Emergency Services. So uh, in 1995 and 1996, I was called to help provide communications for two pretty big events that happened on Long Island. Uh, one of them were the wildfires that affected the east end of Long Island. Um, so we uh, provided lots of communications for a period of about three or four weeks there. And then the following year, TWA Flight 800 crashed off the south shore of Long Island. And again, I was called to provide and help uh, with the emergency communications for that event. Um, since that time, I have trained and uh, volunteered my time for non-emergency events, but leading up to the potential to use them in case of an emergency. And like Ted said, helping out in marathons like the New York City Marathon or just some of the local 5K runs that are held throughout the, uh, the local area. And uh, I'm still involved in the amateur radio emergency services. I uh, serve as the assistant emergency coordinator for my town here on Long Island. And I am also involved with the... Uh, CERT group, which is the Community Emergency Response Team, where I serve as the uh, radio officer for the uh, the county CERT program. Oh. Uh, Ted, uh, Joe, uh, uh, similar stories to Ed's in, in terms of have you seen ham radio, uh, you know, in, a, in an essential service when communications go down or in an emergency situation? I guess I'll go next. Uh, I, I've just had a couple of instances. Uh, I played with the California Angels in, uh, from 77 through 1980, and we were living in Laguna Beach, very close to the ocean. And uh, this was pretty early on. I think at the time, I probably only had a general or advanced class license at that time. And uh, I used to come home after the, you know, the ball games, get home 1130 midnight or so, and grab a couple of glasses of wine and I had a basement station and I would go down there and turn on the radio. It was my way of unwinding, relaxing after a ball game. And one of the nights I went down there, uh, I heard uh, a boat down the Caribbean actually calling for help. And they were taken on water. And I was able to call the local Coast Guard station there in Southern California. And uh, back then you could dial the operator and say, can you connect me to a, you know, the Coast Guard station? I told them, what frequency I was listening on, talking to these guys, and they were able to connect with the people down in Florida and actually go out and rescue these guys. Uh, the other time that I did any kind of phone patch stuff at all was uh, back, I can't even remember the year now, but when Mexico had the huge uh, earthquake, I don't know what it was, 15, 20 years ago, I can't, it, time flies by, <laughs> but uh, you know there was a, a big need for, uh, you know, safety and welfare messages being passed back and forth, people trying to contact family and friends down there. A lot of Americans, of course, go down to Mexico and, and spend the winters or have actually moved down there. So those are the two main periods that I was involved, uh, that I actually did anything during emergencies. Wow, that's Joe, that's amazing. You, uh, 
you saved a ship at sea. That's pretty incredible. I One know. time in 45 years. <laughs> yeah, but it's great you did that. You were at the right time and the right place, kind of like when you were a baseball player. <laughs> hey, the U stays up all night. You never know what you're going to find when you go fishing that lake. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I um, I and there's been so many well documented uh, success stories of ham radio saving the day, but I remember one vividly because it happened to myself. I was a very young professor. Um, we had just had our third child born, and we decided to take our first family vacation ever. I think it was 1990. We had a brand new minivan. And we drove down to the west coast of Florida. Um, we were going to take a vacation. I was working hard as a professor, assistant professor, working for tenure. So I wasn't getting much time off. And I was trying to build this new research program in wireless. We And I was doing a company also. So we needed a break. We drove down in the family minivan, had a great vacation. And on the way up from Florida back to Virginia Tech on the interstate, we're driving along in northern Florida. And all of a sudden, I'm in the traffic on the interstate, and a semi truck in front of me all drops a giant angle iron. It's like 12 feet wide and six inches tall. And I couldn't avoid hitting it. And our van went right over that angle iron and it sheared off the gas tank, which I had just filled up, full tank of gas, and it ripped the entire gas tank and spilled. 20 gallons of gas on the interstate. I had no power. I lost control, but was able to get miraculously, grace of God, got the van over to the side. Uh, luckily, no one wrecked. It was horrifying, but there we are stranded in Northern Florida on the side of an interstate with no car and no power. Well, thankfully I'm a ham radio operator. I had my trusty handy talkie and I got on the local repeater on two meters. This is before everyone had cell phones. In fact, I was doing research on cell phones and my hometown Blacksburg, Virginia did not yet even have cell phones or maybe only a few people had it. But luckily through uh, the grace of God and the ability of ham radio, I was able to make a call and a local ham drove right out to me, called AAA and the ham radio community took us in, helped us find a hotel we were stranded for two days because they had to ship the part in for the gas tank to the local um, repair shop. But if it weren't for ham radio, I don't know what would have happened. It was starting to be nightfall. So that's just a typical typical example of, I think, ham radio, how it helped people before the cell phone industry. And it's still valuable when you don't have cell phone coverage. That's remarkable. That's a harrowing experience. Um... It, you know, some of these stories reminded me, you know, the, 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 the Titanic, uh, the, the, there's, a, the, there's a lot of uh, uh, connectivity to the Titanic between Marconi and Tesla. Uh, in, in fact, when the Titanic sank, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, we said that, you know, Marconi and Tesla were contemporaries and um, we are committed to telling the story of Tesla and his contemporaries as accurately as possible. You know, people see them as were well, they adversaries and competitors, and to an extent that they were, but they were also somewhat collegial with each other. Uh, Tesla, you know, on a flip side, outside of wireless, you know, people see Tesla versus Edison and AC versus DC, and sometimes the stories around them that surround them are embellished or changed. It's almost like playing the game of telephone. They've been told so many times as folklore that they've changed. So for, for us as a science center, we're, we're trying to study the facts and, and, and report them as accurately as possible so we can learn from them. And you know, uh, a lot of the folks that are involved with the Tesla Science Center, like, like Ted or like uh, Vint Cerf, uh, one of the fathers of the internet, uh, and, and uh, Marty Cooper, uh, the inventor of the cell phone, uh, who, who Ted uh, and, and Vint had introduced us to, uh, they all have uh, been involved with the Marconi Society for a number of years as well. Um, so my understanding is Tesla came up with a lot of the foundational building blocks for wireless. Marconi moved very fast. He used, utilized some of those building blocks that Tesla created, 
uh, and it might have been with Tesla's blessing because uh, they were collegial um, for a while until until the money filed, uh, followed Marconi and then there were patent battles. But, um, you know, so f- from our standpoint, Marconi, I think he used like 17 of Tesla's technologies, but he got that signal off and that's important. Um, there, and, and as, as uh, Ted alluded to, there's this, you know, this, uh, they, they both were looking for funding to, to do wireless and Tesla here at the lab that we pre- are preserving and, and, and opening to the public, this was supposed to be the epicenter of wireless. He had a 187 foot tower that he uh, was uh, funded by JP Morgan to do wireless communication to Europe. Um, and Marconi got the, the, the signal off. He did Morse code. Uh, Tesla was trying to do two-way voice like ham radio with multiple channels. And, and Morgan calls Tesla on the carpet and asks, how did this guy beat you? Um, and, and Tesla, like he didn't, he's doing something different. Um, so it's, it's simpler. I'm trying to do two-way voice. And, and JP Morgan was like, I didn't need that. I just needed Morse code. I just needed to know the New York Stock Exchange ticker tape, you know, when I'm in London. Uh, and then Tesla, you know, came, came out and said, um, I also think I could do wireless transmission of electricity with the same towers. Uh, and we'll get into that in, in a little bit. But and Morgan, what do I need that for? How do you make money off of that? You can't meter it. Um, so there's there's a couple of different stories that we're trying to uh, research where either Morgan was concerned with wireless transmission of electricity that it would compete with the transmission distribution system Tesla already invented that Morgan and, and a lot of his you know uh, companies were selling you know rubber and and copper and so the, the wired system for for transmission of electricity uh, so he was concerned and, and and upset and and did what he could to ruin Tesla or the other side of that story is that Morgan just saw it as too risky and had no interest in investing. And, and Tesla was having a hard time raising capital after Marconi was able to get that transmission off. But I, I mentioned that, uh, you know, we were talking about a, a bo- the boat sinking and, and, and Joe, you were able to help save uh, the people on that boat with, with uh, radio. Well, when the Titanic went down, Tesla's star uh, or, or, you know, set uh, because um, Jacob Astor was on the Titanic and he was uh, a very good friend of Tesla's and a potential investor in Tesla's wireless. And he died in the Titanic. Uh, and, and his brother took over the Waldorf Astoria where Tesla lived um, and had run up some debts. And they ended up booting him out of the Waldorf Astoria, taking over this property, knocking down this tower. But when that Titanic went down, there was a Marconi system on board and they were able to use wireless communication and, and the radio to communicate that it was going down. And, and there were boats in the area that were able to come to the location and at least save some of those passengers. And so Marconi stock rose in the, in the wireless uh, community uh, as a result of that. So it, you know, Ted has heard me say that we want to look at wireless past, present, future. Um, and I'm not gonna get into too much cellular here today, but um, you know, for wireless, for, for ham radio, what is the future of ham radio? Is there new innovation that we should be looking towards that you know, uh, we're not even thinking of uh, that will continue to make ham radio more than, more than a hobby but an essential service. Well, I, well, again, I only know a tiny bit compared to Ed's involvement in the VHF, UHF stuff. But uh, like I said, I, the one thing now, this FT8 and the ability to, uh, you know, in a, an emergency with very small antennas, very low power, being able to communicate almost around the world, depending on what band you're on. Uh, and, and pass messages back and forth, uh, way below the level that we could hear with our ears. And there's so many different ones. I, I don't even, uh, haven't really gotten into the whisper and there's all these other different VHF, UHF type things they're doing. 
And uh, of course, we have our own satellites, ham radio satellites up there that people communicate through still. And, uh, uh, you know, as I said, I think a lot of the hams that have gone through this period, a lot of us are getting older now and uh, are not able to keep up the big stations. And it's just as ham radio technologies improves, like I said, I'm here from a fairly large station to just a simple 20 foot tall piece of metal. And I'm able to talk all over the world with the new technology they have now. So I think it's going to continue to grow. And, uh, you know, technology continuously changes. And ham radio has always been on the forefront of that. Yeah, K1JT, Joe Taylor, is a Nobel Prize winner, uh, astronomist, radio astronomist, who uh, uh, has developed a lot of these amazing computer modes that Joe mentioned, uh, Whisper, WSPR and FT8, FT4, that allow uh, digital communications to computer to computer on very low power, 20 watts, 100 watts to go all over the world. But there are amazing innovations continuing to happen in ham radio, and it's really ham radio that's led the wireless and internet revolution, and it continues. For example, the original phone patch that Joe and I used when we were hams in the 80s and the 70s uh, led to cellular telephone. Packet radio, the idea of packet radio, uh, that originated in ham radio and then it became adopted throughout the entire internet. And that's now how all voice co calls are done in the cellular industry. Hams for decades have been pioneering this radio spectrum up at millimeter wave and sub terahertz frequencies. Those will be key frequencies for 6G and 7G cell phones 10, 20 years from now, that's going to happen. And uh, we there, and continuing to develop infrastructure equipment that allows basic science to happen. There's a huge effort funded by the National Science Foundation and it's ham radio operators who are professors that are building low cost channel sounders to sound the ionosphere, to figure out what's happening several hundred kilometers above us and what the solar energy does to our uh, ionosphere. Space weather, turns out space weather can affect uh, how well satellites work, how well our electrical equipment works. It may hold the key to the future of the global climate, climate change. Ham radio operators are building the equipment that becomes low cost and easy to use, and then is used for, as Joe said, experimental purposes. And CAMs continue to do that and it's a great platform where the hobby is actually dedicated to hobbyists. It's not for business, but it creates this great playground of radio frequencies to build anything you want, to try anything you want, uh, and with this global community. And Ed, you've probably seen other things as well in the emergency field. Yes, I. Uh, prim my primary uh interest in communications is VHF and UHF. And I have been, since I got back into the hobby a few years ago, I've been involved in a lot of the digital voice modes, DMR, D-Star, Gaysu Fusion. And the, uh, the new open source mode that I'm involved with is uh, M17, which is a new digital radio uh, protocol for voice and data. So we've been doing a lot of work there. Um, my, uh, my knowledge base has grown tremendously working with some of the individuals in that field and seeing some of the, uh, the visions that they have to take uh, these new technologies um, into space, doing a lot of satellite work, which uh, I'm starting to get involved with now myself. So uh, definitely a lot of uh, great things I see on the uh, horizon for amateur radio. Um, and the more younger people that we get involved with this, we're going to have another revolution of uh, the, the, the next technology out there. And it's going to uh, once again be started in the ham radio community. Yeah. And I think, I, th there. I think having high school teachers and college teachers and grade school teachers getting uh, kids used to the idea of wireless and electronics, that can only help us to, what, to your point, Ed getting the youth involved, I think there's a huge opportunity and lots of resources there. The, uh, the STEM curriculum is definitely uh, going to boost the ham radio community in the future. And uh, that's something I'd like to get more involved with, becoming a mentor to some of these uh, younger high school students and maybe grade school students who do have an interest in wireless and uh, 
some of the other technologies such as robotics and whatnot. And uh, I can help as much as I can. And if I don't understand it, I'd be more than happy to learn it and pass the knowledge on to, uh, to the future of this great hobby. And that, you know, the, the, the limited knowledge I have, so I am not a ham radio operator, but I do aspire to be one. Not yet, Mark, not yet. <laughs> exactly, I do aspire to be one. But hanging out with you guys over the past few years um, and, and talking to folks like, you know, uh, Ted, uh, our friend Vint Cerf uh, working at Google now, I know one of the projects they're looking at and, and I think he's working on is using a form of ham radio for interplanetary communications. Uh, knowing that some of the largest tech companies in, in the world are, are looking at, you know, what happens when we do colonize Mars and how are we communicating? And uh, it's not going to be a cell phone call. It's going to have to be a, a ham radio. And if that is our future, however far away it is, uh, not only do we have to get the next generation excited about this kind of communication and understanding it so that they can innovate, um, there's going to be a whole new level of jobs around this. And it's not just a hobby. It often leads, it often leads to a great career. In fact, uh, there are still companies, engineering companies, where if a kid comes in and he or she has a ham radio license, it's almost a guaranteed job uh, because you learn so much uh, by doing, by experimenting, by gaining intuition. That's what the hobby of ham radio allows someone who's young to do. And so parents, teachers, I, I think they all embrace the hobby. It's just, Ed, we need more of you. You've inspired me to get out there and get into the, uh, get into the schools. I'm trying to get W2NYU set, set up. Uh, I've got a, a good administration which is going to let me get the ham radio system uh, going back up the station back up at NYU, but getting at the high school. I know what I can and, do to help. Yeah, thanks. I'm close I, enough. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. But uh, but you know it, what's amazing is is even if even if people find it later in life, it's such a fulfilling hobby where you can meet so many amazing people. Like through ham radio, I've met my baseball hero Joe Rudy. Joe, I watched you when I was a kid in Indiana. I watched you in the World Series. I mean, where can you meet an all-star baseball player? Or Joe Walsh, the uh, guitarist and songwriter for the Eagles. He's a ham operator. King Hussein of Jordan, I talked to him on the radio when he was King Hussein, JY1. And Barry Goldwater, elected uh, uh, politician in Arizona. Yeah. yeah, he was in Arizona, I think. I mean, ham radio operators come from all walks of life, and it builds the soft skills, the social skills when you're young, getting into the hobby of just meeting people from other walks of life. And I feel very blessed to have been in this hobby. It's, it's just been far beyond the technical aspect. It's, it's a community and, and indeed ham radio operators do lead the way and ham radio will be on Mars. I'm sure of it because every technological revolution has had hams leading the way. That's remarkable. So we're coming up on an hour and you've all been very generous with your time. Um, I guess- uh, I'm, Are you I'm gonna let me, Mark, are you gonna let me ask Joe Rudy what are some of his most memorable plays are in baseball? Because I'm dying to know that. I saw some of them. Of course. I, I, <laughs> I was gonna to say, Joe what were the us. questions that we didn't ask that you wanna ask now? And I didn't get a chance to say that, but that is exactly the point that we're at. So Ted, uh, good, good segue. So Joe, do you have any, uh, comment on that? Well, the one thing I always want to add on to what was being said here is that, you know, the, there's so many of the colleges that have had ham radio stations set up at their colleges for, for, you know, years and years and years that, uh, have promoted the same growth, uh, at the, at the colleges. And so I worked many, many of those as I'm sure all of us have. And, uh, in my opinion, you know, trying to get across to the general population that they, people understand that these cell phones are walking around with are basically two-way radios. They're just on a different set of frequencies than we use. And just like the police have their own frequencies, they aren't, the military has their own frequencies, that they're, uh, they're, you know, the spectrum is sort of like a ruler. It goes from zero to infinity. And there are little segments chopped along that line that are given to different entities. 
And, uh, you know, again, cell phones are just another two-way radio. Uh, getting back to baseball, I guess, again, my most memorable ones are, of course, from the World Series days. And uh, uh, I think uh, going back to the catch I made in 1972 in, in Cincinnati, yeah. I don't know how much I have, but, uh, you know, I, I, was a big, I was a big Reds fan. I was a big Reds fan. That was <laughs> the most amazing catch I think I've ever seen. Well, it was uh, it set up by a lot of years. I, I signed out of high school at 17. I was playing shortstop, never played the outfield. Uh, played the, a little bit of third base in, in the minors, uh, not much outfield. I, got, I went actually from A ball to the big leagues in 1967. And uh, when they first put me in the outfield out there, I went to a, a major league ballpark. You know, the hitter looked like an ant. He was so far away. And so it took me quite a few years and I was very blessed when we moved to Oakland in 1968. We had a gentleman named, by the name of Joe DiMaggio <laughs> that, that agreed to become a coach with the A's for 68 and 69. And uh, we had a manager named Bob Kennedy and he and Joe DiMaggio sort of took me under their wing. And every day from the beginning of spring training all the way through the season, or if we had a night game with a doubleheader the next day, uh, Bob would stand over by the third base coaching box. Joe would be in the outfield with me and they would hit fly balls and start teaching me. And I remember, especially in spring training, Joe trying to teach me how to go back on that very play. And I would turn and run to a spot and the ball would be 50 feet over that direction. You know, it, it took me thousands and thousands of, of uh, plays uh, with Joe trying to teach me how to go back and turn on the ball, you know, learn the line where the ball is curving. And, that, you know, that same play that I made in the World Series, I practiced that 10,000 times with Joe, wow. Joe for two years. And it's just one of those fascinating things. And I think my other big moment that comes to mind was um, uh, the home run in the 74 World Series that clinched the World Series against the Dodgers off of Mike Marshall. They had the big ruckus in left field. With Bill Buckner had made a comment back in those days that there was only a couple of players, Reggie Jackson and Catfish Hunter, that could have made their roster. He put that in the paper talking about, you know, fuel for uh, getting people up. <laughs> And uh, so that was a big blow up in the Oakland papers. And so in that fifth game, uh, he had hit a double, trying to hit, stretch it into a triple, got thrown out at third base in the, uh, in the top of the seventh. So when he went up, he was playing left field also, we went out to left field in Oakland and the fans just showered him with beer cups and you name it, they threw on the field. So there was like a 15 minute delay during that time, cleaning up the, the garbage and, the announcer telling the fans to quiet and quiet down and blah, blah, blah. And during that whole period of time, Mark Marshall never threw a pitch, did not do one warm up pitch. Wow. And so he said, I don't need it. Let's go. And so I figured he had a great screwball, which was almost unhittable. And I said, well, he can't throw that with, you know, waiting that long. So I was looking for a fastball inside and he threw it there and I hit the home run. That was the clinching uh, run that you know got the won the World Series that on that uh, three to two uh, on that home run and so it was those are my two high points of my career that I remember the most of uh, of doing that and like I said that you never none of us ever get there by ourselves we have all had great teachers and so many great coaches over my career in the, in baseball and the same thing in ham radio I can't even begin to list the number of people because I have I have no technical background at all. Uh, I did very little on the inside of the station. I was mainly the tower builder and putting the, sta the antennas up and stuff on the outside. And so the thousands, not thousands, but hundreds of guys that I spent hours on the phone asking them how to do this, how to do that. And that's the great thing, as you said before, about ham radio is there's just an unlimited number of people out there that are willing to help you. Is that your uh, World Series trophy that's to your right, to our left, and the gold glove uh, next to it. And what's that bat above above the top wall? Uh, the bat up the top is uh, one of my treasured things of Yogi Berra, who was uh, just a great guy. And I uh, got to talk to him many, many times when we used to the Yankees. And of course, he was coaching the Mets in 73. And I got him to sign that bat in the ball for me. So that's Yogi Bear's bat and stuff. The picture right below that is a picture of, of Babe Ruth and Yogi. I wish I had those both signed. Wow. Uh, but Yogi was uh, one of my idols. He was just a, a tremendous, you know, you're talking about somebody that was 
persona on TV and stuff, he was exactly like that off the field. Just funnier than heck. That's great. Amazing. That made my day. <laughs> Thank you for sharing <laughs> that. All of our days. Yeah. Uh, Ed, any closing comments on your end? I just want to uh, say that uh, for those who aren't involved at radio, hopefully that this sparked a little interest in them. And uh, feel free to reach out to one of your local radio clubs or reach out to the Amateur Radio Relay League and find out how you can uh, get licensed uh, in your local area and uh, join this great hobby. Uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting lots of great people in the hobby and uh, getting to play around with some really cool cutting edge technology and experimenting and building antennas and radios and whatnot. And it's just been a blast. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for having me here today, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you, Mark. Thank you, Ted. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mark. You, this was uh, uh, really appreciate all the time and, and the conversation today and um, look forward to uh, continuing that conversation. Maybe uh, next year in celebration of National Radio Day again, we could reconvene and we'll invite more friends that we uh, mentioned today on the call. Great. That's 73 <laughs> in Morse code. That means best yeah. wishes. Yeah. Yeah. everyone. Thank you everyone for joining us here today. It was an invigorating conversation on, on a technology and a hobby that uh, not only helps spawn innovation, but has a tremendous future. Uh, the Tesla Science Center will be working with our local radio club, Ed and, and his members, uh, to get more and more involved, which makes a whole a lot of sense for the Tesla Science Center to be involved with the amateur radio movement. Uh, so if you're listening to today's broadcast, uh, please reach out to us if you have an interest in ham radio, and we'll continue to compile a list of, of folks that need training uh, or who want to be networked with uh, the individuals in this movement. Thank you so much.
that were doing contests and uh, they, they have a, a huge variety of contests. Almost every weekend you can find one type of contest or another. They probably have a, a dozen or more that are what we call worldwide contests where you literally get tens of thousands of guys on at the same time uh, making contacts around the world. Uh, you know, they, they do a point system maybe for different how many countries you work. Uh, there's uh, other uh, contests that are more regional, like just say, you know, North America type things. There's uh, uh, things called CUSO parties, which uh, promote uh, activity where uh, different states will have what they call the statewide. Like I think the uh, next weekend is a Florida CUSO party, which is a very active one. Uh, and then I always did the one out, they called it the, the uh, seven land CUSO party, which is all the uh, Western states that, that have a, a seven in their call sign. They're, as you look across the United States, there's 10 different call sign areas from one to zero. And uh, so like the Northeast up in the New England area is one, New York, New Jersey area is number two, three is like Pennsylvania and down in that area, uh, four down the Southeast, then you work your way all the way across uh, the state of California is a six call. Anyway, so they have these excusal parties to promote activity, to get guys on the air. And the, uh, you know, there's all kinds of types of that. Uh, and it's just, again, piqued my interest. Uh, the more I got into it, the more I enjoyed it. Um, to me, contesting was sort of like baseball. For me, um, I always felt like my baseball season was a reflection of my off season. You know? How much time did I spend working out, doing weights, taking extra hitting? I had a batting cage in my basement. Um, you know, how hard I worked in the off season reflected in my season. And the same thing, we have what we call more or less the main contest season is from October through the end of March. And so I would spend the summertime making sure all my antennas were, you know, in good shape. The rotators that turned the antennas were working fine. All the networking and stuff between the radios were working. And so I would spend that whole summertime getting ready for the fall contest season. And it, it, it's, as I said, it was a great vessel for me to transition out of, you know, playing baseball from the time I could first remember five or six years old until now I'm in my late thirties. And all of a sudden I walk out the door and I really don't have any driving entity that I, you know, baseball was for me for all those years. And I was able to transfer that into ham radio and into contesting. And it just, Give me a, a, an extra reason to get out of bed in the morning, I guess. That's really fascinating, Joe, to hear you uh, talk about the uh, competitive drive that you had in baseball and taking it to contesting. That was exciting to me. Yeah. Uh, so actually, the, the next question is for you, Ted. Uh, what do you think, this is from Doug Borge, uh, what do you think is the great, single greatest invention uh, on ham radio over the last few years? And then what do you think is coming down the pike? Wow, single greatest invention. I don't know what the greatest, I'll just rattle off a few that I can think of just off the top of my head. Uh, the packet radio and terminal node controllers. There was this organization in the 80s called Tapper. Very early 80s, it started linking radio, ham radio, digital computer packet data across the country. And that really led to uh, packet radio and uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, the cellular phone, we talked about it in the segment, the phone patch. So many engineers at Motorola and other great cell phone companies who did phone patches, they were the engineers that went on to invent the cell phone and the cellular networks. Uh, I think the digital modes are amazing that Joe Taylor, uh, K1JT has pioneered. And uh, there's just so much uh, that's innovation. Channel sounders, uh, software defined radio is huge. There are now companies making software defined radios that you can buy at relatively low cost that, are very, very amazing high quality receivers using open source software, SDR, software defined radio. Those are just a few I can think of. And I think uh, the ionospheric studies and space weather, I think there'll be big breakthroughs that ham radio operators make from the equipment and the 
engineering and science that's going on now to study the ionosphere, to study uh, how the earth behaves based on the sun and galactic weather. And I think deep space exploration, uh, interplanetary internet hams will be there for that as well. I see a lot on the horizon. That's, uh, you know, it, I, we've spoken a little bit about uh, the ionospheric studies uh, earlier in the program, and I'm glad you brought it up now. Um, for me, it's an area that I want to study more in my understanding of Nikola Tesla and what he was trying to do here at Wardenclyffe in terms of uh, radio communication, global radio communication, and uh, his two different methods that he was testing out, whether it was ionospheric uh, transmission or using the Earth's Zenic wave. And uh, he was also trying to do the transmission of electricity, same, same signal, um, which from what I understand, you don't have to plug in the ham radio. So uh, it, when you build your own ham radio. Uh, but uh, for, for us internally, we're gonna be doing a lot of study there and then we'll follow closely what's happening in the ham radio segment ionos on ionospheric study. Uh, we have a question from Bob. We have two Bobs, uh, but so this one is from three N, uh, KN3 NIE. Uh, and he said he got started around the same time as Joe using a Philco rounded shortwave. Um, and um, hold on one second. I just have to move this over so I can get to the rest of this question. Um, and this question is for Joe. Do you work any nets or are you on a certain time and frequency when we can make contact with you? They want to work you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> they can come meet you at Dayton this year. Yeah, I'm going to be at Dayton. That's, I'm excited to finally get back when they have crowds again. It's been two years since they've actually been able to have the Dayton Ham Fest, which is the world's largest gathering. There's like 30, 40,000 guys that come from all over the world. And a lot of women. There are a lot of women now in the hobby, of, too. It's amazing. There are a tremendous amount of women and a lot of great women contesters and a great CW operators, especially in Europe. I mean, there's some great ops over there. Uh, actually, Morse code is a, uh, a very, uh, it's, it's much more uh, of a sporting type thing in Europe. They have uh, some competitions there that are mind blowing as far as the speed that these kids can copy. And, uh, but Bob, uh, you, you, my call sign's the same, nk7u at nk7u.com. Send me a, an email. We can set up a SCAD to get on. I don't have regular hours that I get on anymore. When I lived out west at my station, used to get on every night uh, between 9 and midnight or so with a, a group of hams, uh, 20, 30 guys every night. We would get on and talk about contesting, et cetera. But uh, here uh, where I'm at on the East Coast now, those guys, I'm long gone to bed before they get on anymore. But uh, send, me a, send me an email and we'll be glad to set up a schedule with you. We'd love to talk to you. Awesome. Uh, looks like we have one more question. And again, feel free to put questions in the chat. This one is from Doug as well. Uh, first, the, you know, the, the preamble is he thinks that Nikola Tesla would really appreciate uh, this program and, uh, you know, Ted, uh, Joe, um, Ed, and myself. Um, and, and back to the, the ham radio role in space. I know we talked a little bit about this, uh, but is there anything additional that either of you can comment on in terms of, you know, the future of ham radio in space, how that would work, or, you know, um, is there anything else that we left out that we should uh, discuss to give, to illuminate that? Go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead were, no, go ahead. You're much more knowledgeable with this stuff. No, no, I, I'll, I'll hear what you say and then I'll, I'll add to it. I'm thinking of a couple of things, but. Well, I, all I know mainly with the space station and, uh, you know, the, the uh, sending up a, a, a good portion of the astronauts that went up into space and went to space station, et cetera, all were required, I believe, to get their ham license. Uh, before they went up. And there was actually a uh, ham station set up mainly in the VHF, UHF mode that uh, as emergency backup communications in case the were wiped out somehow. And uh, 
uh, over the years, I've talked to him a couple times up there, and uh, I know it was a big thing for years and years, and I still think they may be doing it. Uh, when I was younger, my kids were in school, was uh, the local ham clubs were taking um, portable uh, VHF stations to schools and setting up a, appropriate time you could sign up to talk to the astronauts as they passed over your area. And it was a, you know fairly quick, maybe 10, 15 minutes at the most, uh, that you could talk to the guys. And uh, Ted, I don't know if you know or not, I don't know if they're still doing that as oh, yeah. much. It was a big thing uh, when my kids were in school that being able to talk to the astronauts. Well, they still do it. And um, it's funny, I was just at the RARS Fest, the Raleigh Amateur Radio Society Fest this past Saturday. RARS Fest is a typical ham radio event or a ham fest. There are about a thousand people in total, and they actually had satellite demonstrations as part of the ham fest. And one of the things I wanted to add, what you said, Joe, is um, there's a group called AMSAT, Amateur Radio Satellite Foundation, which is yet another one of the many facets of this great hobby. And AMSAT helps promote the development, the engineering, and the launch of satellites around the world. And there's actually many dozens of ham radio satellites, maybe even more than dozens, might be a hundred or more, that are these small satellites. They're called small sats or very small satellites, which are often built by high schools, colleges, universities, government laboratories, working with college students to launch these small satellites that stay in orbit for 10, 20 years or more. They're in low earth orbit. So they're only a few hundred kilometers above earth and they pass every 90 minutes or so. And they constantly circle the globe. So they come around every day or so to what Joe is saying. And you can actually talk to it with very low power with an antenna aimed in the sky as it travels through space. And I got to see a demonstration of that this Saturday. It's a very interesting and active part of the hobby. Again, wonderful for youth to get involved in how to engineer a satellite and learn the physics of orbits. And of course, the kids that do this, the boys and girls who, who gain an interest in this often go into the industry often get great jobs at companies like SpaceX and others that are launching these satellites now for global internet and internet of things connectivity. So there's tremendous activity in satellites and space. Uh, astronauts take ham radio uh, up into space, into the space station, and uh, it will just continue. Awesome. One area I forgot to bring up was the, you know, you know, the, uh, the uh, Boy Scouts actually have an amateur radio badge because I've got a couple of grandkids now that are, are I'm trying to help through to get their, their ham radio, amateur radio badge for the Boy Scouts. And uh, so it's great that that organization still promotes that. Awesome. Uh, so there's a question, we have, we have questions coming not only from the chat, but those that are watching on Facebook and, and, and live on YouTube, we had one coming through the email. So I don't know who asked this, but I heard you learned how to operate ham radio. Uh, so I'm, this is for Ted. I learned, I heard you learned how to operate ham radio during childhood because of an injury. Can you tell us more about this? Our family is interested. Okay, sure. Um... Yeah, when I was 13, I had the best break of my life. Uh, I broke my leg playing sandlot football. I was going to play on the freshman football team, but in Cambridge City, and I broke my leg. It was a terrible break at three places. I was in a body cast uh, for six months after being in the hospital for six weeks at the start of the first year of high school, ninth grade. So I was there unable to do anything but listen to a shortwave radio, and I listened uh, around the world on HF, because all I could do was lay there, and my um, my grandma had bought me a shortwave radio, and I heard ham radio, and on these shortwave stations that broadcast from around the world, like HCJB in Quito, Ecuador, or uh, uh, Radio uh, Japan, and um, Radio Germany, Deutsche Welle, I, I would listen to 
programs on the radio that would broadcast about ham radio and about DX. DX is long distance. And it's how Marconi used the ionosphere back the turn of the 1900s to launch really the first telegraph company. And I taught myself Morse code. And so in high school, listening in a body cast, I taught myself Morse code, started to learn about electrical theory. And then I was able to hitchhike up to a local ham's house, WB9NNO. Um, Doc Woodward, he was the veterinarian in town in Cambridge City, Indiana. And uh, Doc Woodward gave me my novice license and let me go up to his house you know, every evening after school and tune around on his ham radio. He had a great station. He had a cubicle quad antenna. Ironically, the same antenna that was invented by a Mr. Moore, the engineer at HCJB in the 1930s uh, in Quito, Ecuador. It was 10,000 feet or so above Earth and the corona discharge would break the Yagi antenna, which was a directional antenna that had been invented about 15 years earlier. All the stations around the world used Yagi antennas to rotate and directionally aim the energy onto the ionosphere to talk around the world on low power. But HCJB had to invent the cubicle quad, which was an antenna that was a closed loop. And here was Doc Woodward, you know, I'm 14 years old, using a cubicle quad antenna. He taught me all about radio. And then I went to college at Purdue at W9YB and, and got into contesting at N9MM in Indianapolis, uh, just like Joe got into contesting. So I really learned and was able to fuel the passion of ham radio while I was in high school. And my best friend, N9NC, Tom Poland, he was my same age. Uh, we would talk on the radio every night. I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, before uh, the internet and before cell phones, it was very expensive to call long distance. Even 20 miles away would be 50 cents a minute. And that's in 1980, 1970 prices, 50 cents a minute to call long distance. And Joe knows this because he used it when he was in South America playing ball. So ham radio was free if you had a license. So I would uh, call Tom, he lived about 20 miles away when I moved away from Richmond, Indiana, Cambridge City. Uh, so it was a long distance call. So we would call each other's house and let the phone ring for just one time. We called it a ring signal. And actually we called it a rig sig because in ham radio, you have a ham radio rig and you use abbreviations all the time. Signal gets abbreviated to sig. So we called it a rig sig. So if the phone rang for a half a ring, you know, our parents or our siblings knew to tell one of us, you just got a rig sig. And that meant we got up on the air and we talk on a specified frequency. So I learned all that in high school before I ever went to college. That's awesome. That is awesome. And, and you know, now, Joe, that, did you, does that sound familiar, Joe? Oh yeah. I, I wanted to throw in one thing for people that are not hams that may be interested with the people that asked you was that in today's world, the hams actually give the tests. And so in every area, they have volunteers that sign up through the licensing entities. And so usually it takes three hams together there, but they, instead of going to a government office, like, you know, Ted and I did where, you know, which was sort of scary. Very scary. Very, <laughs> Very scary. scary. Now it's held in a, you know, a grade school, high school that they're giving the, the local hams actually uh, handle the education part of it. And then they, and then they, give the test. So it's much more relaxed, much friendlier, much more encouragement. And uh, it's a lot easier to get your license today than it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So I just want to get that across to follow up the people that, that asked Ted that question is that, you know, you, you can find out pretty readily in your area, the, the ham clubs, and they would know who, when they're going to have classes and when the tests are. And in fact, the pool of questions that are asked on the exams, usually at these ham radio events, ham fests, or at classes, all the questions are published in advance. So if you wanted to memorize everything, you could, and you could pass your ham radio exam. Of course, it's better if you learn the material so you can actually uh, learn from it. And you don't even need to take the Morse code. When Joe and I got our license, you had to know Morse code but they abolished that requirement 
uh, you know, over 15 years ago. I love the Morse code. It happens to be my favorite mode of communications because you can go the farthest on the smallest power with the worst antennas. It's very narrow bandwidth, but you don't even have to know Morse code. The questions are open and there are lots of study guides, good materials on the web for learning the code. And, and hams all over the world will help you get your license. If you say you're interested, you will always find a group of hams to help you to administer the exam and to teach you along the way before the exam. You're muted, Mark. Well, thank you for that, Ted. And uh, any other questions in the chat? Okay, I think with that, I would just wanna thank our guests for their time today. Um, really helped us uh, reach out to, you know, some folks that are interested in ham radio, but I think we have a new audience as well. And uh, my being one of them, I, I'm hoping to come through those trials and, and eventually take the test. Um, so you're going to see more and more ham radio activity at the Tesla Science Center. Um, with that, I'll turn it over. Staff, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, Doug, do you have any uh, questions or comments before we sign off? Uh, this is Debbie. Price and I just want to let everybody know that this is going to be that this was recorded and it's going to be available on our website. Uh, Joe Rudy also gave us some book recommendations that we're going to post on the site. Ted, if you've got any, you can email them to me, and we'll also be adding some images that you guys sent me to this so that we can have kind of like a really cool audio visual presentation from it. And that's at teslasciencecenter.org. Okay. With that, enjoy National Radio Day, National Amateur Ham Radio Day. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks Welcome for the attack. Today. <laughs> Enjoyed it. You guys it's did great, great having you. Thank you. 73. 73. That was awesome. Thank you so much, folks. 73 is awesome. Yeah, I'll see you at Dayton with an eyeball cue, so Joe. Look forward to Absolutely, it. Absolutely, over a cold one. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> see you.